Friends, first of all, uh, it's such an honor and a pleasure to be with you this afternoon, and thank you so much for the invitation to speak to you today on India's role in the changing world order from a perspective from Europe, mostly from uh, the European Union. Uh, I must say that today is the closing day of uh, what has been a wonderful, a very productive, but a very busy week here in India. Uh, visiting as a distinguished visitor, um, this was uh, or has been my first visit to India. Never had an opportunity to visit before, but certainly uh, also the first uh, in a number of visits uh, that are to come. And I can for sure say right now that I will be back in October for the, for the International Olympic Committee session that will take place in Mumbai, so I'm very much looking forward to the visit. When I decided to travel to India and when I came to India, what I told students in New Delhi and uh, in um, the, the places that we've visited and we just um, came from Hyderabad today, uh, what I said is that uh, from Croatian perspective, as uh, a country that has had um, centuries old um, interest in India, as a country that used to be part of the former Yugoslavia and thus part of the non-aligned movement in which we are observer right now, I dare say that we know quite a lot about the history of India. But what I came here to do, what I wanted to do is learn about the present, about today's India, and try to figure out what's um, in for all of us in the future. And what I wanted to do um, is to come here and establish contacts with people, with businesses, with the government, with academic institutions, NGOs, and others, and hopefully contribute to the future of our mutual relations, not just between Croatia and India, and India and the EU, but really resolving the current issues, the current geopolitical issues, the great challenges that stand before um, all of us at this point in time. And speaking today, you will probably find my perspective a little bit different from that of India's on the topic of um, the changing world order or um, what is going on in the world today. I must underline though that I will be speaking first from the position of uh, Croatia's civil servant and Croatia's uh, president, minister of foreign affairs, etc. as an international official. But the second position from which I will be speaking is also from a person who was 23 years old when the war broke out in Croatia. When Croatia was attacked, when about one third of our territory was occupied, when horrible atrocities were committed, first in Croatia, then in Bosnia and Herzegovina, then in Kosovo, and a person who lived through the peace process negotiations uh, in Croatia and Bosnia and Herzegovina, and who has seen how much it takes, how much effort, both from us who lived in Croatia, um, all the communities, and the international community first to be able to reach peace, to find a settlement, and then to work on reconciliation and building, paving the road for the future, which is a most difficult one. So when we look at the challenges of today, there is no easy solution. There is not just one um, statement that can resolve. Certainly we can all agree that wars ultimately end in negotiations and peace processes, but there is so much that has to lead um, to those negotiations and of course the road after the negotiations of reconstruction, of reconciliation is a very difficult one. So today let me address um, uh, three main points. First of all, to set the geopolitical context from the um, uh, perspective of um, the European Union, from the perspective of the transatlantic community, and um, as I said, someone who's lived through uh, the, the process in Croatia and later worked in Afghanistan, for instance, in trying to also bring about uh, peace and security and stability on the country. Then, second, I want to talk a little bit about the European Union in this geopolitical uh, context uh, with a bit of an, uh, a focus on uh, the strategic, the concept of strategic autonomy which was mentioned today in the context of India. 
uh, and uh, I'd like to explain the, uh, the, how I understand the European concept, which is fre frequently misunderstood and taken uh, solely as a military, as a defense concept. And third, of course, I'd like to talk about um, India, how I see India in the context of EU's policies, in particular towards uh, the Indo-Pacific, and uh, what I believe or, or what our expectations are of what India can contribute uh, to resolving uh, the great challenges that we face today, because you certainly uh, have great potential, and this is um, India's mo moment, and this is the time of your choice. So first, looking at the geopolitical situation for a number of years, we have been repeating the same phrase that the world is at an inflection point. And uh, that, of course, refers uh, not just to the great events, the great disruptors, but also refers to the relationship, the relations between countries globally, the divisions into block of uh, countries, and uh, the um, ideological re realignment. Uh, the world has become a contested place. We see competition. We see that what traditionally used to be the instruments of soft power, such as trade, investment, infrastructure building, uh, international aid, etc., have become instruments of hard power as well. Uh, we have seen disruptions of supply chains and we have seen many processes that are leading to decoupling of the world into these ideological spheres. People commonly defend the West and I don't like that term because uh, I don't think that democracy can be defined in any geographical terms and besides I particularly do not like the term the rest against the West. What I prefer to say when I refer to the European Union, the United States, and all other <coughs> democracies, and India is the biggest democracy in the world, is uh, the world of aligned democracies. And uh, obviously there is decoupling, there is a tendency for a rise of authoritarianism in certain states and certain areas, and there is a rise in popular support towards authoritarianism that we even see in our own countries and in the countries in our uh, neighborhood and particularly when it comes to Croatia's neighborhood because there is perception that authoritarian states can have a better hold on keeping peace, security and stability for the nations. But the danger of that is um, the concentration of power and the filtration of information and uh, lack of judgment or informed advice that can lead to devastating circumstances. Now, if we look at the great disruptors, just as we were starting to recover from uh, the pandemic, which caused a recession in many parts of the world, uh, energy a crisis, supply chain uh, crisis, and certainly a health <coughs> crisis, just as we were starting to recover from that, then we saw another great disruptor, and that is the war in Ukraine, Russia's invasion against Ukraine. Um, that certainly, the war in Europe is obviously something that the EU is occupied with. And I understand that uh, from your perspective, and now let me just refer back to what your own foreign minister said during one of the um, conferences uh, in Europe. Uh, it's not going to be an exact quote because I, I don't remember his exact words, but he said, you Europeans, should not think that every European crisis is a global crisis, referring to the war in Ukraine. However, you should also take into account that there are many other crises globally that should be your business and that should be Europe's problem. Now, I do agree with the second part of the statement in particular, because I believe in the EU, and again, judging from my own experience, when we saw the inability of the EU monitors to stop the war in Croatia and of the international community to stop the war in Bosnia. I agree that yes, too often do we turn a blind eye or we're too slow to respond, etc. But our collective response to that war in Ukraine was something that um, had gone beyond my imagination and hopes in the way which the United, uh, United Europe, the European Union, would react in terms of the speed and the depth 
of uh, the, the reaction to, uh, to that crisis. Now, with the first part of his statement, I, in this particular case, I do not completely agree because I do believe that this war is a global problem for several reasons. First of all, speaking from the point of international law, it's a complete breach of the UN Charter and of international law principles on state sovereignty, territorial integrity, and ultimately the right of every nation to choose their own future and to choose their alliances, political, military, or otherwise. Namely, Russia had recognized Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders and through the Budapest Memorandum and negotiations, in return for Ukraine surrendering nuclear weapons, Russia was one of among a few countries who provided security guarantees to Ukraine for its peace and stability. That, uh, the first breach happened in 2014 with uh, the referenda and the illegal annexation of the Crimea, the war in Donbas, and then on the 24th of February of last year, Russia walked openly into Ukraine and started a military aggression, which in my opinion was a huge strategic mistake on behalf of President Putin. Well, when we look at the aggression itself, obviously this is of global consequences because it sets the precedent in the 21st century that uh, you can potentially change or you can at least attempt to change borders by force. This is a territorial aggression. Let us remember that the war is not being fought in Russia, that Ukraine has not attacked Russia, that it's uh, <coughs> Russia's troops who are on Ukrainian soil. So it is a military aggression and occupation of another state which sets a dangerous precedent anywhere in the world that anyone who is bent on changing borders of another country uh, can proceed to do so without uh, global consequences. And this is why for the European Union it is very important to insist on the principles of the UN Ch Charter and of international law on which we should all agree. Of course, there are other global circumstances um, or, or uh, consequences of this war as well that we all feel in the EU and worldwide, some people more than others. We were lucky in Europe that we had a mild winter. So we had enough gas, uh, we had um, enough uh, fuel to be able to provide heating and electricity to people, but I don't know what's going to happen next winter or the winter beyond that, because for far too long had Europe relied uh, on commercial, uh, or at least part of the European Union, on Croat uh, uh, commercial reasons only uh, in uh, looking at its energy policy and making itself dependent from single sources of uh, energy supply, not looking at the security of supply uh, and not um, uh, looking at that diversific diversification, which is um, uh, ultimately very important also for political stability and security of any country. So we have seen uh, energy prices soar around the world. In the meantime, they have dropped somewhat. But again, there are years ahead of us before we're able to make that energy transition to renewable or other sources of energy and build the appropriate uh, capacities. Of course, that will all affect another uh, joint problem that we have, and that is climate change, that, it, that is getting worse with this uh, crisis. And I have always called climate change a weapon of mass destruction that is in our hands, and where we can do so much more together uh, supply chain routes of food, of even uh, migrations, uh, and refugees um, out of uh, Ukraine with the current state of the war where Russia is attacking <coughs> energy and civilian infrastructure, trying to exhaust uh, Ukrainians to stop fighting, and trying to exhaust the rest of us to stop supporting Ukraine in their right to self-defense. So, Moving on to Europe, what the European Union has done and does. For us, it's, um, there are two, for us, for NATO, for the transatlantic uh, community, there are two basic goals. First, 
is to provide support to Ukraine to be able to resist that aggression and to defend themselves as a sovereign and independent state uh, with territorial integrity, which is immensely important for the future of our continent, as I've already said, for the future of international law as well. And the second important point is to prevent escalation. This war escalating outside of the conventional uh, way that it's been fought so far, although very exhausting against civilian populations and with many hybrid elements and elements of uh, emerging and disruptive technologies. Nevertheless, we see mostly World War I, trans trench warfare, World War II, artillery warfare, and um, this um, horrible grinding attrition. Uh, that uh, that the the point the military um, point in the war has reached. Uh, the coming weeks will be an important turning point, and there are two factors that will determine the future of that war, but also the future of our global relations. First, um, in the, the medium term, is uh, the announced and uh, the upcoming Ukrainian counteroffensive. Uh, as both sides at this point need to gain something in the war. For Russia, for Putin, it's an existential issue. He needs to prove that Russia can uh, win, uh, that they can get territory back that has been uh, retaken uh, by Ukrainians. And Ukraine, of course, needs to demonstrate that they're capable of the self-defense so that they continue uh, taking back the territory and about 13% of Ukraine's territory is currently under Russia's occupation. And therefore the support of uh, the EU, um, the United States, etc. Uh, will depend on the momentum in that war as the publics, the people, are getting rather uh, war fatigued uh, and there uh, are bound to be questions what is the point of the war and whether uh, the two sides should be forced at the same table. The second element that will determine the medium and the long term is Russia-China relationship. We have seen President Xi um, visit Moscow just the beginning of this week where they reaffirmed um, the strong um, connections between Russia and China. However, I do believe that in the previous months and especially Following uh, the joint declaration by President Xi and Putin in Beijing, the beginning of 2022, about uh, a friendship with, without uh, global limits, that uh, the, the Russian aggression that came only weeks later, and the brutality of that aggression, it must have been an unpleasant surprise, surprise to President Xi. And we have seen through the months that follow, develop that relationship in the sense that even Putin himself admitted that um, the Xi has made complaints about uh, the brutality of this war. And certainly I um, believe that China has put pressure on Russia to stop talking about the nuclear option because obviously a nuclear war can never, cannot be won and should never be fought and it's um, dangerous to even consider and threaten such options. Now, with uh, reaffirming this relationship, of course, looking at what has happened in the meantime, and I mentioned that President Putin made a horrible strategic mistake. When he came to power in 2000, his goals, his political manifesto, were to restore Russia's power. He thought that Russia had been humiliated at the hands of the West, NATO mostly, and the United States through the times of the Cold War. And he wanted to restore first Russia's standing in the world and second Russia's economic power. And he was on the way to that until the 24th uh, of February. Now it would take a really long time to go through all the phases of the aggression, but as I said, we've reached a stalemate, which has been quite detrimental to uh, that political manifesto, the political program, and basically destroyed the goals of President Putin. A year after sanctions, Russia has not been brought to its knees, but obviously sanctions will work long time. Russia has already become a junior partner to China, not an equal in that quest to try to resist uh, what they believe is the hegemonic 
ideas of the United States and the so-called collective West to dominate the world ideologically and in every other sense. Russia's economy has been weakened. They have suffered horrible human consequences of this war as well. And the military, um, the military sales, the, the military support, and you see it here in India, you have been transferring to other technologies for year, but you're bound to transfer even more to, to other technologies rather than Russian in your own defense and armed forces. So um, the, the position that China will continue to take, whether President Xi will use his influence to try to persuade Putin to really sit down at the table, and go well beyond the 10-point plan that was presented by China, the peace plan, which is more of a geopolitical statement than a detailed peace plan, or whether potentially China might provide uh, military aid to Russia uh, could be uh, one of the decisive factors in the war, war that could uh, ultimately escalate it further. Now, with the, when it comes to the EU, as I said, I have been rather pleasantly surprised by a unified, a collective decision of the EU on the way forward, on the way how to react to that aggression. Because we did not see that even in 2014 with the annexation of the Crimea. And I think that was one of the elements that in addition to uh, having himself isolated by a group of people who were telling him uh, what he wanted to hear rather than what the situation was, President Putin thought that the reaction of the international community would be rather meek. He did not probably believe they were ready for sanctions, but I don't think that they were ready for this kind of, the scope and the depth of the sanctions. And uh, the, uh, the situation for him certainly is not comfortable. And, and it's not, um, the, the preference would be not to act on our own. So moving to Indo-Pacific and moving to India, let me just uh, point out um, some factors that we find very important when it comes to the European Union's perspective of the Indo-Pacific, of India, and, and uh, uh, India's role. Well, first of all, as we know, the Indo-Pacific is the home to three of the four largest world economies outside of the EU. Um, that is China, India, and Japan. Uh, it contributes uh, two-thirds of global growth. Um, Indo-Pacific is at the forefront of the digital economy and technological um, development. It is central uh, to global value chains, to international trade and investment flows. Uh, so the EU strategy uh, is inclusive of all partners in the region in Indo-Pacific wishing to cooperate uh, with us with the European Union when our interests coincide. And I see many of those interests. And we're stepping up our strategic engagement with the with this vital region. Um, and this region's, uh, as I said, growing economic, demographic, and political weight makes it a key player in shaping the rules-based international order and in addressing global challenges. <coughs> challenges with the strategy, the EU aims to contribute to the region's stability, security, prosperity, and sustainable development in line with the principles of democracy, rule of law, human rights, and international law. Um, and, as I said, defense and security are, are also um, important elements of uh, EU's Indo-Pacific strategy that seeks to promote an open and rules-based regional security architecture, including secure sea lines of communication, capacity building, and enhanced naval presence in the Indo-Pacific. So, looking at the potential of cooperation for India, let me just highlight three um, areas that we find very important in the context of um, European main developmental and uh, um, growth priorities. First is energy and climate change. Second is digital transformation. And the third is demographic revitalization. revitalization as uh, in Europe we face uh, aging populations, demogra uh, demographic decline, labor shortages, so we definitely need to invest a lot more into human resources and look towards other parts of the world where we can, with the movement of people,
contribute to our common uh, uh, growth. So with our goals being peace and security, not just in Europe, but globally, and consolidating EU's position as a leading economic and political actor, we see a lot of potential to work with India. Now, with India's foreign policy, uh, the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy uh, is very much alive. And I must say that when it comes to the war in Ukraine, uh, the EU very much uh, appreciates and welcomes India's readiness to contribute to peace efforts and what uh, Prime Minister Modi said to President Putin that today's era is not an era of war. We also very much appreciate um, the statements uh, from India that dialogue and diplomacy are the way, the way forward and as well as Prime Minister Modi's warnings about using nuclear facilities uh, or any type of nuclear threat um, and um, uh, as, as the endangerment of all the humankind and of course we very much appreciate your humanitarian assistance to uh, Russia, Ukraine. Now, with your standing in the world, with your position, you truly have this uh, great potential to influence the course of this war, uh, to work towards finding the peaceful solution so that we really have genuine negotiations. Uh, somebody mentioned uh, here today uh, the India's position, which is not siding by, um, to, to either side, that, that it's being neutral. One of my specific proposals would be, since India is chairing the G20 this year, to invite Ukraine as a guest to these events, especially Ukrainian parliamentarians, Ukrainian parliament, and to hear from those people about what the situation in Ukraine from the, their perspective is. As I said, I've come here to India to learn about India, and the best way to learn is through people-to-people -people contacts, because today's media is saturated with all sorts of information, and selecting that information becomes one of the biggest challenges. So, it's really up to India to present today your story <coughs> to the world, where you are, where you stand, not just with respect to this particular war, but when you stand when it comes to protecting the values of um, international law, of international order, of rules-based economies, societies, uh, governments, uh, and of respecting the dignity of every single individual to have human security. Not just security from war, but the right to development, to education, to healthcare, to work, uh, and uh, the right of choice. Uh, I would say that the eyes of the world are upon you right now. And it's not just in the context of, of the G20. It's in the context, obviously, of next year's elections as well. But it will be much in the context of what you do in order to contribute to this world not being polarized and divided, but that we truly work together so that no nation dominates, that there are no bullies, who are allowed to rule in any part, and that we do work together towards what is the main point that we're, walk, we're talking um, about here today, is that peace, security, and human harmony, which remains so much more uh, of an ideal, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be everything humanly possible to achieve it. Thank you.